Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it really, it's an honor and a privilege. You built Right Media, which you sold to Yahoo for, was it $850 million? which is an enormous exit, particularly at the time that, that you did it. What was that experience like? What was it like building Right Media? And maybe explain a little bit what Right Media is. Sure. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, Right Media was a, was was my first foray into uh, into entrepreneurship. Um, I, I wound up uh, by a very circuitous route, uh, working at DoubleClick in the late '90s. Um, learned a lot about the digital advertising business there, and came up with this crazy idea that that we should be trading digital advertising the way that we trade stocks. Um, and so, Right Media was the first, uh, I think, at scale digital ad exchange. Um, uh, which uh, which I started in 2002 as as kind of the the uh, the meltdown the dot com meltdown was um, beginning to sort itself out um, and then just happened to catch the timing just right the market was ready to transact that way and we uh, you know we we sort of saw this incredible growth in the the business um, and it kind of we went we sort of went from from one meltdown to the next meltdown in in uh, 2000 and seven april of 2007 as things were starting to get a little bit squirrely in the financial market we sold that business to yahoo during a sort of extraordinary time when uh google bought double click uh microsoft bought a quantiv and uh 24 7 media was acquired uh all in the span of about three weeks so it was kind of a wild uh platform shift that happened what did you learn about growing a company and scaling a company that quick uh, I learned a lot. Um, you know, you, you learn a lot about, you know, it's interesting. You learn a lot about how many things can break and you can still succeed. So that's probably one of the, one of the great lessons is that as long as you're fault tolerant and as long as you are, are paying attention to what's not working, you can actually break a ton of stuff and still overall have tremendous growth and tremendous success. Um, it, maybe the, the, you know, the, the biggest part of that learning curve was, was how how hard it is to go from this sort of fast moving fault tolerant uh you know highly innovative you can you can get a bunch of things wrong as long as you're willing to sort of wake up the next morning and say okay we got that all wrong let's change it into an organization like yahoo uh where my organization went almost overnight from about 350 or 400 people to about 5000 people and realizing that that same methodology just didn't work at all there i spent most of my first year at Yahoo running the advertising marketplaces, figuring out that all the things that made right media work didn't work at Yahoo because you couldn't make a decision and then decide a week later that you wanted to undo that decision. Once you've sent 5,000 people off marching in a direction, um, you know, you sort of have to maintain the pace for a period of time where everyone starts bumping into each other. So um, I'd say that the, the learning curve was more than just the right media learning curve. It was the transition from that high growth into the into the larger scaled enterprise. Yeah, five thousand people is a ton of people. <laughs> that yeah. that's actually More an enormous team. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's who was the CEO of Yahoo at that time? Uh, well, I, I ran through a series of CEOs there. So uh, we so what had happened with Yahoo was they invested in our business about half a year before they bought us. So they. Um, you know, the, the, the thesis at the time was you, you, no one can, it was that the, the large principal players in media, so this is in 2006, couldn't own the platforms. So the, there was this thesis that DoubleClick couldn't be owned, Right Media couldn't be owned, Aquantive couldn't be owned by anybody who had a principal player in, in a role in the media space. Um, and, and when Hellman and Freeman put DoubleClick for sale and it became clear that Google was going to buy that business, the rules all changed. And so everybody had to, had to, had to own their, 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 you know, every principal player had to own, own the ad platform. Um, and, and so, you know, when, when all those rules shifted, this all, all these, all these transactions happen and you, you kind of wake up one day and you're doing one thing and then you wake up a month later and you're, you're doing something entirely different. How long did you stay inside of Yahoo uh, until you left and did uh, your WGI group? Yeah, so um, I was there uh, actively until the end of 2000, about two and a half years. Uh, I had agreed to stay for three years. Oh, sorry. You know what? You asked me the CEO question. So. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Terry, even I, even I forgot yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So so so, and, and, you know, I I got sidetracked. So 
but it's interesting part of the story was Terry Semmel was the CEO when they bought the company. Jerry Yang had been very actively involved and he and I in, in the investment and, and we'd, we'd become very good friends. Jerry stepped in and took the CEO role when, when Terry stepped down rather unexpectedly, I think. Um, and then, uh, and then I get maybe a little over a year later, Carol Bartz became the CEO. Um, then they had, I think after that, I, I left shortly thereafter, um, you know, we just kind of agreed that it was, it was time. Um, and then I think they went through, they had Scott Thompson and there was a bit of a debacle there and then Marissa Mayer and they eventually sold the business. So it was something like four or five CEOs over the course of those three years. Yeah. It's Yahoo is such an interesting case study for business. I mean, it was, uh, the leading search engine there for a bit, like just so yeah. much cash and money. And like, it, yeah. it's really, we actually have, um, the, the current CEO of Yahoo coming out to Utah to speak in an event. Um, here later this month. And it's just interesting the way that business has evolved. What lessons do you take away from Yahoo, both good and bad, about what to do and what not to do? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it relates to what I'm doing today, right? So when, so, so the first year at Yahoo was absolute torture for me because everything that, like I said before, everything that worked building right media as a private really high growth, really entrepreneurial company didn't work inside Yahoo. And it took me, it took me really a full year to recognize that, you know, my behavior had to shift, that I wasn't going to be able to bend the will of, you know, of, you know, bend Yahoo to my will, that I was going to actually have to bend to the way that that organization worked. Um, and I really spent the second year figuring out how to get stuff done inside of that organization at an incredibly difficult time. So while I was trying to figure that stuff out, we were going through a hostile takeover. That, that's when yeah, Microsoft was trying to take the business over. Yeah. We were trying to defend ourselves or figure out if that was if that was the right thing. Um, and uh, you know, there were just huge tectonic shifts happening in the search landscape, and Google was kind of eating everybody's lunch at that time. Um, I ran the advertising marketplaces businesses there, so it was search and and display and sort of all of the underlying ad products. Uh, but not the sales and marketing of the of of the of the media platform. And so, you know, I, I kind of left there after two and a half years, feeling like the last thing I would ever do is run something with with scale again. It was, you know, I, I was so burnt out with this idea that, you know, there was all this process and bureaucracy, and it was hard to make anything happen. That I just that I said like I'm I'm done with that. I'll never do anything like that again. I want to be, you know. In, in the early stage, um, preferably not in the CEO seat. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I think at the time when I left, I just didn't understand a lot of lessons that I had had learned and internalized and never would have guessed that like, you know, now, you know, 12 or 13 years later, those lessons would actually be really valuable to me in, in, a, <laughs> in another twist where I am now actually running something again at scale. Yeah, why does that happen? Why does at scale it become so bureaucratic and so slow moving? I mean, I think it at some level it has to, right? So it's if you go back to like, you know, if you if you've got a couple hundred people and you can you can literally run around and tell people what to do, right? Mm -hmm. And if you sort of get everybody going in some direction, you know, you're going east and all of a sudden you realize that hey, the destination really should be north. You can sort of like, you know, run to the front of the column and say, hey, don't go east anymore. Let's go north, right? Um, you, you start trying to do that across a, a global footprint with thousands of people. You know, by the time you get to the front of the column, you know, the column's broken up, right? Everyone's kind of going, going different directions. And so, you know, I think at some level, part of what I didn't understand at that time was that, you know, moving a little slower is actually an, an asset inside these larger organizations. But I think it, it can be it can be overdone to the point where you get so slow that you're paralyzed. And I think we did go through a bunch of that at Yahoo, where you know it, it got so big and so bureaucratic, and there were you know it was so so disparate that you know you couldn't actually the whole the whole column just stopped moving. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Um, and what did you do? So so you left after two and a half years, and then what did you do after that? Um, I took like six months and did nothing which is actually the biggest piece of advice I give to everybody who, who, you know, sort of goes through these. I mean, that the, the sprint from between the, the kind of dot-com meltdown in 99 and, and surviving that inside, inside double click. And then the sort of, you know, four year sprint building the company and the three years of, of uh, 
of, of the Yahoo experience, like you're, you're just toast, right? Your brain doesn't work right. You're, you know, you're, 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 I just think it's hard to even think straight. I had, a, I had four young children at that time. Um, well, actually I had three, I was expecting a fourth. Um, and I just said, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, I just need to depressurize. Um, and so I, you know, I wasn't healthy. First thing I did was a, started eating right and exercising and got myself back to a state of sort of physical balance. Um, and I, you know, I, I, the only thing I told myself is I will never, ever be the CEO of an operating company again. Um, which, which, you know, I, I share that just to express the futility of making statements like that. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, you, you can say that, you know, there are a lot of things we can say, um, in, in moments. And I actually believed it. And, and I, for 12 years, it felt like I was going to keep that promise to myself. Um, you know, and that's a different, that's a different story. Um, but yeah, I, I think the depressurization is incredibly important. And then you can start thinking about the future and, you know, after that kind of six month hiatus, the thing that, you know, that was that I was, you know, eager to do more than anything else was get back to the sort of startup creation um, thing. And so so the way for me to manage that was without while also keeping my promise that I wasn't going to run anything was to get involved in, uh, in in investing in startups and mentoring entrepreneurs and helping people go through the the, you know, the, the cycle that I had just gone through, which is how WGI got started with my partners, Jonah and Noah Goodhart. How did that go? How did, uh, being an investor, did you like that? Did you like the pace of that? Um, what were you looking for in entrepreneurs? What was there like particularly particular sector of tech you were investing in or not tech at all? It was mostly tech. I mean, I think actually, I, you know, for the first couple of years, I was, I was a pretty awful investor. Um, and I think, I actually don't think it's that unusual. I think what happens is, you know, I was never an investor before I was an entrepreneur. And then I had this incredible entrepreneurial run, you know, where, where we went from sort of zero to almost a billion dollars of value in four years, um, which had a lot to do with market timing and luck and some good execution as well. And then you, you sort of, you know, you, you think that everything's going to work that way all the time. Right. And so you bring this like you know, sort of irrationally optimistic lens to the, to the investing world. And so basically what we, what I did for that, for that first kind of year or two is just invest in everything. Um, and it was always like, you know, my, my lens was like, I'm sure we can make this work. And it turns out that actually, you know, it was completely the wrong lens to, to be a good investor. The good investor is much more cynical. They're much more thoughtful about the the market opportunity. So I invested in a lot of businesses that, you know, weren't going after big enough markets that, you know, with entrepreneurs who I liked, but in, you know, I, I was sort of attracted to the inexperienced entrepreneurs who reminded me of myself um, and thought that that's where I could, I could provide the most help. And we had some really nice wins, but I think we had a bunch of embarrassing, you know, sort of terrible investments along the way too. Tell me about moat.com. Yeah, so so Moat um, was was a big winner, um, mainly because my partners Jonah and Noah Goodhart were running it. So um, so Jonah and Noah had been the you know had basically been you know co-founders of Right Media. They weren't active in running the business. They had been my largest customer at DoubleClick, and when I left DoubleClick, they wrote the angel check for Right Media, um, joined the board, and were you know amazing partners to me during that um, during that run. And so. We all had a great run together, um, had a lot of fun, did a lot of cool things together. And then we started w that's WGI Group as Walrath Goodhart Investments. So it's pretty simple. Um, and it's Jonah, Noah, and myself. Um, and so after a couple of years of investing, uh, I think that they sort of got the operating urge again. And they they we, we, we kind of came up with this idea that turned out not to be anything like what Moat turned out to be. It was, it was, we had this idea about, and really they, they drove it about creating a creative marketplace where you could crowdsource creative uh, advertising design. Um, and, and it turns out that that actually wasn't much of an idea, but we created a set of tools that allowed the designers to understand how users engaged with advertising. And that became kind of the kernel of the, of the uh, Moat. Um, situation. So Moat was kind of the mirror image in the sense uh, at Right Media, I was running the company, I was operating, I was doing that, and Jonah and Noah were on the board providing support. Um, you know, they gave me they gave me the title chairman, which was probably overstated. 
um, they were out there <laughs> running the company, doing all the hard work. And I got to attend board meetings and kick ideas around and talk to them. But um, it was, a, you, know, you know, just another amazing outcome that very coincidentally sold for the same dollar amount that Ray Media sold for. That's so fascinating. That's incredible. That's your number. Apparently, that's, yeah. That's your number, man. Uh, you also I started. Our, I haven't checked our market cap today, but it's probably around the same point. <laughs> that's awesome. You also have a. You started a production company where you focus on uh, documentaries. What inspired you to do that, and what have you learned from that? And maybe tell us uh, a couple of the the films that you've put out. Sure. Yeah. So I actually, this is one where like I had even less to do with this than uh, than than Moat. Um, the, the company Atlas Films was started, uh, so one of my, uh, friends from growing up, uh, incredible, uh, person named Stephanie Sucktig, uh, we, we lived, we were neighbors in the city, um, uh, right after college. And so we used to, you know, buy the cheapest bottle of wine we could. And we, she, she worked for, she'd gone to NYU and she worked for Barbara Walters and Bill O'Reilly and did a lot of, uh, yeah, TV production. And so she, we would sit around and drink really cheap wine and talk about, you know, how someday, you know, we'd make movies that mattered. Um, and, uh, and so uh, after the right media transaction, as we were kind of going through figuring out what was next, she and I started talking and along with my wife, Michelle, about, you know, some of the issues that you could tackle with a long form documentary film. And so her, Stephanie's really, her, her sweet spot is, is going deep, deep, deep onto an issue and really understanding the complexity of it. And so we made a number of films. The one that Michelle and I were the most actively involved in was uh, was a film called Fed Up, uh, which we made, I believe, in 2014. We released it, and it was just a, you know, at the time, a really deep ex exploration of what was going on with our food system, and particularly um, the the amount of added sugar and uh, processed food that was, you know, and 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 the linkages between that and metabolic disease and disorder and things like that. Um, but it, you know. We, we were pretty active in that one. Stephanie, really, it's another one where, you know, it, it, it looks a little better on the Wikipedia profile than, than it probably is. You get these fancy titles like executive producer, but, you know, what you really do is, is fund some projects and provide a little bit of input here and there, and then you get to show up for all the fun stuff. Yeah, I remember Fed Up. That was a big documentary. That was, that was incredible. Was, yeah. Really fun. Amazing. Like, you know, it was sort of, I didn't know anything about how that whole world worked and, um, you know, I, I, I got to be part of the negotiation when we sold that, um, which is a whole nother story that, you know, um, uh, I actually hung up on Harvey Weinstein. That was my, uh, that was my, I was going to ask, it's, it's the funniest thing ever. I was going to ask you if you ever loved it. <laughs> he, we saw, yeah, his, 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 his company bought that film. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, he, he was, he was, you know. Uh, yeah, without without getting into a lot of detail he was a real jerk in the negotiation process and there was a point where um where we were on the phone with him and he you know he he was doing things that you know really were uh, you know sort of outside the lines and i just hung up on him um and it actually completely changed the 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 sort of the tone of the negotiations because you know i think you know they figured out we weren't going to be bullied into into doing something dumb and um, so that, you know, I, obviously I didn't, I didn't know him at all and I didn't know any of the stories or anything like that. I just, uh, it was a, it was a very interesting introduction to, you know, sort of the culture of Hollywood. That should be the beginning of your Wikipedia page. You hung up on Harvey <laughs> Weinstein. That is freaking cool. That's unbelievable. It was, hey, a, it was like, a, you know, it was like one of those moments where you just like, you, it was almost like the out of body thing. And it was, it was probably exactly the right thing to do. And if I were like, if I were, if I weren't so honest, I would tell you like that it was all calculated and it was like, we're just going to, we're going to show these guys that we don't care. And that, you know, if they want to do business with us, they're, they're, they're not going to treat us this way. But it was actually just like, it was like one of those moments where you just like, it was so outside the the pale what was happening. And I just was like, we're, we're not doing this and hit the, and hit the red button on the phone. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then we kind of looked around and went, I was with Stephanie and we kind of, I kind of looked at her and I was like, I think it's, I think this is going to be okay but I wasn't actually totally sure it was going to be okay. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, at what point do you uh, get involved in Yext? So that's actually one of the first things I did. So, so, it, you know, I, I already, you know, I lied when I said I took six months off and did nothing. The first thing I did <laughs> when I left, when I left Yahoo was I, I invested in Yext. 
Um, and, and the backstory there is, is so Howard Lerman, who started Yex, amazing entrepreneur, I had met while I was, uh, he worked for another company. Um, he had sold a, a small company to another company. He was a customer of ours at Bright Media. And so he and I met and became friendly. And he started, uh, he started Yext in 2007, I believe. It was a completely different business than it is today. And he came to me and he asked me to invest. And I said, yeah, I'd love to invest. And I, I did the thing you had to do working at Yahoo, which is I went to Yahoo and said, I'm going to invest in this thing. Do you have any problem? And, uh, and they blocked it. Um, somebody in legal decided that there was enough competitive potential um, to some voiceover IP business that we had that they'd said, no, you're not allowed to invest in the business. And so I actually missed the first round at Yex. Um, yeah, at Yex, because I, I couldn't invest. Um, and then as soon as I left Yahoo, I called Howard and I said, look, I really wanted to invest and now I can. And he said, okay, well, he said, I'll, I'll figure out a way to get you in. And he found a, he had a shareholder who wanted to sell their stake. Um, and so we started WGI group bought that stake and then we continued to invest in the next couple of rounds. Um, and around 2010, uh, the company was going through sort of a, a really significant pivot from being a marketing services business to a software business. And, uh, and he asked me, he said, look, you know, uh, why don't you lead this round, this kind of pivot round and, uh, and we'll make you the chairman of the company and you can, I was already on the board, but he said, you can take a more active role, um, and I, I jumped at it. It was a perfect scenario because I didn't have to run the company. He was doing that. He was doing that really well. Um, but I got to be in there. I got to go to the office whenever I wanted. I got to be in the environment. It was it was everything I wanted without actually having to be in charge. <laughs> That's awesome. What's, what's that business like right now? It's interesting right now. Um, so, uh, so I became chairman of the company in 2010 or maybe early 2011 officially. Um, we had a great run. We took the company public in 2017. Uh, the business had started as, you know, really a business managing the third party digital experience for location based marketers. So that's like just a bunch, that's a bunch of words, but what it really means is if you have a bunch of locations, it's, it got, it's really hard to manage all the information about all those locations manually. And so you need a software platform to do it for you. Um, and, and, and that's how the business started. Uh, that was the big pivot. Um, where it is today is it's a fully functioned, composable platform for all digital experiences. So we can build, uh, we can help companies build any digital experience uh, across their own properties or across the external web using a, a platform and set of services built around uh, composability, API connections, and AI. Again, just another series of buzzwords that means a lot to people who understand what the sort of evolution of the digital experience is. Um, so, so you said, how is it today? Um, we had a great couple of years as a public company, and then we ran into a series of challenges uh, that included, you know, realizing that probably the initial market wasn't as big as we had thought it was. Um, and then the big one was uh, we were highly uh, concentrated in retail and hospitality. If you think about, you know, who who has scaled physical location footprint, it's those companies. And so, in March of 2020, our business changed fundamentally because uh, everything we we did as a company was geared around the idea of driving people to visit stores. Um, and in March of 2020, for a very long period of time, that was not much of a priority for our customers. Um, and so the company from, you know, really 2020 until um, it th through today has struggled. Um, and and it's, it's what happens when a high growth company um, sees significant growth deceleration and has to deal with, you know, the, these these realities in their uh, in, in 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 the market dynamics and how the business is being executed. Um, along the way, uh, you know, and I apologize this bit of a ramble, but it's it's kind of an important part of the story. Um, we did something really important in 2018, which made us look very silly for a few years, which is we made this massive investment in generative AI as sort of the core of the future digital experience. And we had this thesis that, and Howard really drove this with Mark Ferentino and some other people at the business, that the, 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 the digital experience of the future is going to be heavily informed by things like semantic and vector search and generative AI large language models. And for like two to three years, we talked about this and nobody cared. Mm -hmm. um, and we tried, you know, we tried to get people excited about it and nobody cared. Um, and last November, suddenly everybody cared because ChatGPT had sort of set the world on fire. 
Um, and so what we're dealing with now is the, you know, kind of, you know, turning a business around in the public markets and the worst software market we've seen in the last 15 years, um, while also trying to uh, educate the market around, you know, what's going to happen when this generative AI, you know, wave breaks. What is your take on the current state of AI and, and its future? It's the future. I mean, it's the future in the way that like the internet was the future. So, you know, I, I think the reality is the way you'll know that it's the future is that we'll stop talking about it. Yeah. Right. So to me, I think where we are with, with AI in general is, is we're in the kind of late nineties phase in the internet when, you know, all you talked about was your, was your internet strategy. Right. And then by the time you got to, you know, you just look up 10 years later, nobody talked about their internet strategy because everything had transformed and it was at the center of everything that you did. Um, I, th I think we're at the phase now where, where we all talk about our AI strategy. We all talk about, you know, the importance of using it, the importance of it, embedding it in our products. I, I think in five years, we won't actually talk about AI because it's just going to be assumed it's going to be part of the environment. Um, and if you're not using it, then you're, you're, you're left in the dust. Right. So there, there aren't, there weren't too many companies in 2010 who didn't have a, a web presence. Um, I think, I think that's where AI is headed. And I think it's going to transform the way that we do business in some really positive and some really disruptive ways. What have you learned about leadership throughout your career? Like, like some really strong leadership lessons, both good and bad, what you've seen work, what, what you've seen haven't worked. Yeah, so so it's interesting. I was talking to uh, somebody about this recently. So everything I learned um, at Right Media about you know sort of being at the head of the pack, charging up 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 the mountain, um, you know, to build a really disruptive startup and and attempt to get some scale, I had to kind of unlearn at Yahoo and. Uh, and that was, well, what happens when you actually, you know, you, when it's sort of that, uh, you know, uh, dog catches car, right? So it's like, you know, when you're building a startup, all you want to be is big. You just like, I just want to be big. I want to get big. And then you get big and you realize, well, like big is hard, right? Like big is a different kind of hard than small. Small is hard too. Um, and so you have to learn how to manage sort of being, being bigger, um, and, and I think that's the that's the biggest you know thing learning curve on this journey is if you know sometimes you never like a lot of I have a lot of friends who are startup entrepreneurs and they they just do the same they do it over and over again and they're so good at it and it's you know I'm going from zero to a hundred million and I'm going to do that like three or four times in my life and that's how I'm going to create wealth and satisfaction and opportunity and jobs and all the things um, you know I, I did it once and I had a great time doing it but I didn't want to do it again. Um, and and it wasn't until this opportunity presented itself that I realized that I was ready to kind of exercise the 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 learnings that that I was forced to have when I was uh, when I was at Yahoo. Yeah, tell us about the the what you're doing right now. Yeah, so the company I I, I so if you rewind about two years ago, what was happening was you know the sort of the bubble was beginning to to burst, uh, the software bubble that had been driven by. You know, if if you think about you know the the software thing, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, coming out of the financial recession, everybody started investing huge amounts of money in the digital transformation, and so basically the software budget just grew every year, right? And so if you were selling software between two thousand nine and two thousand and you know twenty, you just you knew that there was there was organic growth in your business every year because the companies were going to spend more money on software than they did last year. All right, and that's the environment we've been in. In 2020, I think we had about you know a month where it felt like we were going to have a recession, and then something unbelievable happened, which is basically the software budgets went to unlimited, right? So if you look at any any SaaS company um, from middle of 2020 through middle of of uh, you know 2021, what you saw is just this this parabolic growth, right? And it's because you know, with, 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 with what was happening with the pandemic and this, this push to like, everything had to become digital, everything had to become automated. Um, you know, the, the software budgets went to infinite and, and the growth showed it. And then, you know, the, the other thing we've talked about a lot is that there was this recycling of capital happening too. So like, because every software company was selling so much, they were also buying so much. Right. 
and and hiring tons of people and so the seat license growth was on was off the charts and so uh, you know as all of that sort of transpired we saw this just incredible software bubble and so uh you know about two years ago it started to deflate um, and around that same time, it became clear that, you know, Yext's problems were a lot bigger than just the pandemic. And I think, the, you know, the, the the biggest challenge we had at the board level was identifying that the pandemic wasn't the sole culprit for why our business wasn't growing as robustly as other software businesses were. And so Howard and I, you know, sort of sat, had a bunch of talks. And I think he at that time just felt like he had taken it probably further than he had ever intended to. He'd been the founder and CEO for 14 years. And he, he was ready to do something else. He was ready to get back to entrepreneuring at an early stage. Um, and so I did the only rational thing that a chairman could do, which is I hired a recruiting firm to go find a CEO. Because um, the last thing on earth that I thought was going to happen was that I was going to do the job. Um, but it, <laughs> in the meantime, what happened was uh, someone had to kind of put their hands on the wheel. And so I, I did that. And I spent like two and a half months with the team trying to figure out what was going on, mainly in service of trying to figure out what kind of a CEO did I have to hire? Did I need to hire a product-centric CEO or an operational CEO? Um, and what I learned in that process was that there was a lot more that was going right than that was going wrong, but the things that were going wrong were incredibly um, you know, destructive to, um, to, to how we were trying to, you know, how we needed to operate the business. Um, and so there was a period in that in that where it became clear that actually I was well suited to to taking on the role, and um, then went about you know sort of coming to terms with the fact that that I was going to break my vow that I made in 2010 <laughs> about never never operating again. That's the Dick Cheney move, man. Like <laughs> you know, head head the committee to find the person, and then it just lands back on you. Yeah, it wasn't supposed to be that way. Um, <laughs> But but it was, you know, it was like one of those things where you saw it and it was like, man, like I, there was part of me that w that wished it was a product issue because it would have, it just made it easier. I could, I, I could hire a product CEO and, and, and be the chairman and be part of the turnaround without having to go through the, you know, the, 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 the pain of a public company, small cap turnaround, which honestly, you know, it is particularly hard, um, it's hard in any scenario, but it's it's really hard when you're in a software recession like the one that we're in. Yeah, it's an incredible time to be uh, selling software. <laughs> That's for sure, uh, yeah. Michael. Well, I mean, 12, 12 great years. You got to figure. Yeah. You know, you, the greatest years that... ever, like yeah. the greatest yeah. years ever. So, yeah, I mean, at some point it's got to come to this point. Uh, Michael, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Uh, we end every interview the same way with the same question which is at CEO.com, we believe the chances one gives are just as important as the chances one takes. When you hear that, who comes to mind as someone who gave you a chance? Yeah, I mean, there's a long, there's a long list, right? So the people who hired me at DoubleClick as a totally unqualified English major, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, J Jonah Noah Goodhart, who put, who put, you know, who wrote a check, you know, for a guy who was totally unqualified to to build a business um i mean shoot the the people who are who are sticking with me through this uh through this transition right now um you know it's funny you think like when you become the ceo of a company that like you know it's a, it's a funny way to think about it but like without the team who is is willing to you know kind of go through the fire of having to do this and doing this publicly and having every mistake that we make, you know, and there are plenty of those be, be examined in the public market. Like, you know, th they're giving me a chance to lead them. Right. And I think that we don't really think often, um, you know, in terms of the people who were leading, giving us something, but that that's what they're doing. Right. And if they're not willing to do it, then, you know, we don't, what, what are we, what are we, you know, who are we leading? Um, so I, I would actually, I would say that more than anything else as a CEO is like, you know, you, you, you're as good as the people, you know, who are willing to follow you uh, are. Um, and I think that may be the greatest gifts that you can get. I love it. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.